role. I work with the students and the faculty, and I try to help them appreciate a little bit more some of the programs of inclusiveness and diversity that we work on. Today's forum marks our third year to host this event, and it is designed to help our students to have important conversations surrounding diversity and inclusion in the context of business. We consider this a critical component of today's global and inclusive workplace. Now I'm pleased to introduce to you Ms. Candace Jones. Uh, Candace is Director of Walmart's Global Office of Culture, Diversity and Inclusion. She is a veteran with the company and she has been with it for more than 17 years. So Candace, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Cunningham. Um, again, my name is Candace Jones. Uh, I am extremely excited to be here with you all today um, to talk about why it's important to align the business uh, to our inclusion strategies. Um, and I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but when I was kind of coming into today's um, meeting, I really wanted to kind of make this more conversational. Uh, and so the way in which I've thought about this to highlight the work that we're doing um, is really simply put, what is Walmart doing um, and why it's important? So I'll share my screen and then we'll get right into it. So um, again, what is Walmart doing and why it's important? Um, the way in which I was thinking about this really kind of bucketed into uh, one, three particular categories on why I think it's important to align the uh, our inclusion strategy to the business and the impact that it has. Um, and the way in which I thought about it was also to like, what are the questions that I traditionally get asked when it comes to really thinking about this work, whether that be from family members that, you know, really want to understand what Walmart is doing um, as it pertains to uh, culture, diversity, equity and inclusion, or it's, you know, people that shop our stores. Um, or just other people, you know, um, from other companies that are, you know, really interested in what Walmart's doing. Um, so the first thing that I would say is uh, uh, the top, the tone from the top down. Um, our CEO has done a really good job of really kind of setting the standard um, of what we should be doing as it pertains to moving the needle from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint. I think we all can attest to the fact that 2020 was uh, an extremely rough year for everyone. Um, there was so much happening from, you know, experiencing a pandemic and then um, on top of that, all of the racial divide that we experienced across the nation. Um, here on this next slide is uh, the uh, uh, leadership message that our leadership, our CEO, Doug, sent out uh, last June um, after the brutal murder of George Floyd during our shareholders uh, meeting. Um, and so I'll read it here. I'm adjusting my things so I can see all of it. As an associate at Walmart, you are expected to truly, authentically, and more deeply embrace inclusion. We must work together to actively shape the culture to be more inclusive and not just accept our differences, but celebrate them all the time within every team. We've made a difference in the world in so many ways. We can make a meaningful, lasting difference in racial equity too. Um, so this uh, actual note came again during our shareholders meeting right after the brutal murder of George Floyd. Um, with uh, an announcement that we made that I'll talk about uh, a little bit here uh, or a little bit down uh, in the company commitments. Um, what essentially also too that Doug said during this time was that, you know, basically, yeah, if you want to be a leader and really want to grow your career at Walmart, um, we really need to get on board as we're trained to uh, inclusion and equity. Um, and that really resonated well with uh, our associates across the board with understanding that our leadership was serious about um, the movement that we were going to make in this particular space. Um, and, and so that was always always really critical to ensure that we have that uh, top down message. Um, one of the other things that's really important when we think about, like, does Walmart really care in, in some of the commitments that we've made is our leadership engagement. So uh, Walmart had been already kind of working, uh, doing some training with the Racial Equity Institute and rolling out racial equity training. Um, we've been on this journey for roughly maybe about uh, two and a half, maybe going on three years. But um, after, you know, there were a lot of things that transpired last year, we really wanted to amp up what that commitment looked like. We received a ton of positive feedback about our racial equity training. Um, and so we actually made it mandatory that all of our officers within the company uh, had, uh, had to go through racial equity training 
um, before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we really revved this up and amped this up in uh, July of 2020 um, and have been conducting and hosting almost uh, racial equity training uh, classes uh, almost every single week to ensure that we have all of our officers uh, in compliance by the end of the year. Our fiscal year ends at the end of January. So again, this was a huge commitment that we saw from the top down uh, and to see so many of our leaders be actively engaged in this particular training and just the way in which they are impacted going through, uh, you could definitely tell that um, it, it was proving to be beneficial across the board. Um, for those that don't know, the racial equity training is a two day training that really breaks down the historical con uh, construct of race um, and really helps us understand to how we got to where we are today in the United States as it pertains to uh, race relations. This training um, is life changing. I will say that in my uh, tenure, at Walmart, this is probably one of the best trainings that I've been through. Um, it is definitely something that really helps uh, all of our leaders, you know, uh, walk away with a foundational uh, understanding and a foundational learning. Um, again, of just kind of where we are as it pertains to race, which I think is critical to really helping us shape where it is that we need to go from an organization standpoint. Um, and then the third uh, bullet point here would be around our company commitments. Um, so, uh, back in June, um, when Doug made this announcement, we also announced that we would be launching a center for racial equity and that Walmart would be committing $100 million over the next five years uh, to really move the needle forward as it pertains to racial equity. Um, the uh, intent of this is to really uh, leverage our scoping scale to really drive some system systematic changes, if you will, um, to help us improve uh, racial equity. Um, in addition to that, we also launched our shared value networks. Um, there are four, uh, and again, the thought process is how can we leverage Walmart's scope and scale to really move the needle as pertains to um, these systems that have been put in place to create the discrepancies uh, that we see and the uh, disparities that we see as it pertains to uh, racial equity. So our four shared value networks are uh, criminal justice, um, health and wellness, education, and then finance. So we have a group uh, of associates working on all uh, four of the shared value networks and then work very closely in partnership with the Center for, uh, for Racial Equity to ensure that we are looking at things uh, the right way and that we're moving the needle uh, in the most appropriate way. And then the last uh, thing that I would say that really indicates that Walmart uh, is really serious about what we're doing in this particular space is our public uh, pledges. Um, the uh, Walmart has signed on to a number of different public pledges to ensure that, again, we are looking at, uh, you know, our talent from a uh, uh, gender and a racial equity perspective and that we are moving the needle forward in that place. Um, and again, so I look at this in the question of does your company really care about diversity, equity and inclusion and why that is important is essentially it actually helps with the company reputation. So when I have other people doing outreach to me or when, when I have friends that are asking me, like, does Walmart really care? And I start to walk through, here are all the things we're doing um, to move the needle forward. It really starts to shift people's perspective of who they think Walmart is as an organization um, and, and whether or not like we are being very authentic in our approach and genuine um, and being able to like really take this matter seriously and wanting to do something to uh, shift and change the narrative that we see um, externally. So the next thing um, is uh, I always have people ask me, why would you stay? Uh, Dr. Cunningham mentioned earlier, I've been at Walmart now for um, roughly uh, about uh, 17 years. Uh, it'll be 17 uh, this uh, upcoming year. And uh, uh, one of the things that I'm always really proud uh, to talk about is the work that we do with our uh, associate resource groups. Um, so again, 2020 was a very rough year um, and we actually leverage our associate resource groups to kind of check in and do a pulse check, if you will, of like, how are you feeling? Um, you know, how, how are you being impacted? Uh, and, and are you carrying? We, we re re recognized uh, several years ago um, when we were kind of going through uh, some things was that our associates are experiencing trauma in the world and they're bringing that trauma with them into the workplace. Um, and we learned very early on that in order for us to be efficient as an organization, we needed to find a way to help our associates be able to unpack that to a certain extent. Um, and so we've gotten really good at kind of doing a pulse check and checking in. 
uh, again, this summer was uh, really critical for us. Uh, and so what we put together was company-wide associate listening sessions where we had our chief diversity officer, Ben Hassan, coming in. Um, and we also had our uh, chief HR officer, Donna Morris, sit down and do kind of like fireside chats and have just open conversations where associates could really come through and, and talk to how they were feeling. Uh, how things that were playing out in the world, whether it was the pandemic, whether it was the racial inequities that we were experiencing, how that was impacting them, and then essentially how that showed up with them um, in the workplace. Uh, we always find a ton of key learnings by sitting down, listening to our associates, and really allowing them an opportunity to share in what we would consider a safe place and a safe space for them to really kind of unpack uh, just all of the weight and the heaviness that they were carrying with them. Um, I think also too, uh, we also recognized very early on in the pandemic, you know, associates are at home and they're playing multiple roles, whether it's, you know, showing up today every day to do work, but then also to, you know, being a caregiver because now everybody's at home, you know, having to help, you know, uh, their kids through school, things of that nature. And so we knew that our associates were going through a lot and we knew it was time to post check. Um, also, too, uh, we have a ton of education and awareness initiatives, programs, and events that we've put on that we are extremely, you know, excited about and have been excited to share. Um, and, uh, of course, we are still leveraging our ARGs to partner and collaborate uh, in addition to the uh, Office of Culture, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, a couple of the events that I'd like to talk about and highlight here, um, again, a couple years ago, uh, and and I'll I'll say that Walmart's been on this journey now for several years. So all of the stuff that we you know have done didn't come up just because of the things that have happened in 2020. Um, uh, this has been a journey, and and some of the stuff we were doing beforehand, but 2020 allowed us to really dig in a little deeper, um, if you will, and, and kind of drive some of the points that we had already started with home a little harder. Um, but there, back in 2019, um, we launched a program called Driving Dialogue. This actually was, again, just something that organically was kind of created and built up based off our associates and just some of the things that they were experiencing. Uh, at the time, uh, there was a film that had just dropped called The Hate That You Give. And I uh, distinctly remember an associate saying that they, you know, were on a trip um, with our CEO and the CEO, Doug, was asking, you know, like, hey, help me understand, want to do some pulse check, you know, how are you feeling, you know, through the lens of, you know, as an African-American. You know, you know, how are you feeling about Walmart? How are you feeling about your career? Um, what is it that we need to be doing? How can we be moving the needle forward? And this particular associate, you know, said, hey, have you seen the film, The Hate You Give? Um, and if not, you should check it out because it really uh, does a great job of summarizing some of the complexities that um, people of color uh, show up with, uh, especially within the workplace. Um, and so anyway, this was a really good film. Doug watched it, thought it was fantastic, and then Again, that notion of the tone from the top came um, out and, and told, you know, we kind of put a program together and he, you know, kind of uh, laid the foundation and said, hey, as leaders of this organization, this is a great opportunity for us to really engage and dig a little deeper. Um, we actually, you know, rented out a movie theater locally here um, and did private screenings for all of our associates uh, at the home office to be able to go with their leadership teams and watch this film. Not only did Doug ask that leaders take their teams to go watch the film, but he's also said, you know, take a late breakfast or an early lunch and actually go discuss the film when you're done. So we put together a really robust discussion guide, um, which really created a, a, a common ground for people to really be open and honest about some of the things that we saw uh, be bubbled up in the film, whether it was, you know, code switching, um, this notion of having to have, quote unquote, the talk and what that meant for different um, families and for different cultures. Um, and it really gave us an opportunity to pull back some of the layers, if you will, to really dig into a much needed conversation at that particular point in time um, that is now still relevant to this day. We still have a lot of associates who are fairly new in their journey, um, reference that discussion guide and reference, you know, that film as a way to have open dialogue with their teams, especially when it comes to being able to explain kind of what is currently happening today. Um, in addition to that, we also launched in 2020 a series called the Race Ahead series. And again, this was something that was kind of created and, and organically um, curated um, from some of the concerns that we were hearing from our, our associate resource groups. 
so uh, our Race Ahead series came about uh, in particular, we were meeting with uh, some associates uh, sit in our Hoboken office, which is in New Jersey. And uh, there were some concerns about the disproportionate impact that the pandemic was having on, um, you know, people of color um, and, and what that meant. And there were some associates that were really concerned about like, hey, we're, we're feeling this pain, we're hurting for our family members um, and for our friends that are, you know, being so uh, deeply impacted. But we also want to know what is Walmart doing and how can Walmart step up to help? Um, so that was, you know, we took that concern, we recognized that we needed to do something as an organization. And so what we did was we put together a series of, you know, education and awareness events, um, and we were doing them roughly about two a month. We we're going to kind of slow it down a little bit now and do one about once a month. Um, but we were, uh, we pulled together and had Dr. Sylvia Bartley come in and really talk to us about the disproportionate impact that the pandemic was having. Um, we looked at it from a global perspective, but then really um, fine tuned and, and owned in on what it looked like here within the United States and how that impact um, was hitting different constituent groups um, from a race and ethnicity standpoint. Um, so got a lot of great feedback around that and have expanded the series to just continue to have open and candid conversations as it pertains to uh, race. Um, today, uh, in um, based off what is happening um, around us, um, another program that I like to highlight is uh, a couple years ago. Um, you know, uh, we had some uh, serious concerns from our associates uh, within the Latinx community and with that, within our Asian American community, um, just around the DACA program and some of the changes that were happening there. This program really was one that uh, provided a different level of engagement, if you will, like it really connected to the heartstrings, um, you know, you, to have associates stand up and say, hey, I, you know, am your partner and here's what you expect me to deliver day in and day out. But what you probably don't understand and probably, you know, what you're not connecting the dots on is that um, although I'm delivering what I need to deliver in my day job, I'm also worried about whether or not I'm actually going to be able to be here to see my kids grow because I, you know, am a DACA recipient and all of this turmoil that is happening in the, you know, in, in the world is something that I have to carry with me within the workplace each and every day. Um, great program, phenomenal program. And like I said, a great way to provide education and awareness and connect our associates to things that may not necessarily impact them um, to now, uh, you know, have them tuned in a little bit deeper. Um, one of the last things uh, that I'll talk about as it pertains to why would I stay is the work that we're doing with our uh, communities. Um, uh, we are working on a huge project called the Community Cohesion Project, and essentially that is to create um, a, a more inclusive Northwest Arkansas, our home base, uh, our corporate uh, headquarters is based here in Northwest Arkansas. Um, and this one is something that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, we have so many associates that, you know, are moving to the area uh, to work, um, whether it's at Walmart or some of the other major, you know, companies and suppliers that we have uh, centrally located here. And we always hear, you know, is Northwest Arkansas an inclusive place? Um, and so, although our companies may be ready to have a different conversation as it pertains to diversity, equity, and inclusion, how do we ensure that our community is right there with us and that people actually feel comfortable, they feel welcome, and they feel safe? To not only, you know, uh, come work in an area like Northwest Arkansas, but to live and play in an area like Northwest Arkansas. So when I think about like why it's important to align again the uh, business strategy to our inclusion strategy, um, and and frame it in the mindset of why would I stay? Um, essentially, it boils down to it it increases associate engagement and retention um, when people can feel connected beyond their day job and feel connected and proud of the work that the company is doing and actually feel like that the, the company is invested in them as a person and not just as an associate or an employer, um, we essentially see that people will tend to stay with the organization um, and, and grow and progress their careers in that way. Um, and here are some additional programs that we've done. Again, I talked about the Hate You Give, I talked about Racial Equity in Institute, Values-based decision making is another one to really help our leaders understand like when is the right time and the appropriate time to make the right call. Dining in the dark is a favorite. Uh, it gives our associates an opportunity to actually walk through someone else's shoes. So 
Um, you actually, you know, partner up with someone and actually go and fix your lunch and actually eat lunch blindfolded. So that way you can actually experience again what it's like for someone who maybe, you know, um, doesn't have the same um, uh, abilities that you have. So um, we also uh, do lean in circles. And the last thing that I'll mention here that again, this notion from kind of like the tone, top for the tone from the top is um, we have been doing what we call kind of like a, a Montgomery immersion, if you will, where we've been sending several of our senior leaders to really kind of walk and, and get a, a deeper experience of what the civil rights movement was about and really connect to um, some of the historic moments and things that are there in Montgomery, Alabama. So again, just something to be extremely proud about and something that uh, going a little bit and digging a little bit deeper to help our leaders in uh, the journey, uh, their own individual journey as it pertains to racial equity. Um, the third thing that I always get uh, in, in, in and the third thing that I highlight on why it's important that we connect the business uh, to our inclusion strategy is we essentially need to, need to create a greater sense of belonging. Um, and I oftentimes have people always ask, do you feel psychologically safe? Um, and and we, when we talk about psychological safety, what that essentially means is, you know, it's, it's one thing to talk about diversity and it's one thing to have people, you know, feel included. But do people feel psychologically safe? You could be included and still feel like not comfortable to really speak up, voice your concerns, um, maybe share your innovative and creative ideas. Um, do you really feel like that you are a part of the team and that what you bring to the table is valued and appreciated on the team? That's what we mean when we say, do you feel psychologically safe? Um, one of the other trainings that we roll out uh, and have found a ton of benefit from is our unconscious bias training. And with unconscious bias training, what we've learned uh, there is that, you know, this notion of insider versus outsider. And I think uh, many of you can attest to, you know, uh, kind of what that feels like. If you can think back to, you know, like being in high school, you know, where did you feel like you were part of the, uh, I don't want to call it the in crowd. We call it, like I said, a, a, you know, better terminology with the insider, but did you actually feel comfortable um, and felt like that you were in the loop and that you were in the know and that you felt connected to the work? That's kind of sort of how we think of it here is when people don't necessarily feel included um, or they don't feel psychologically safe, they kind of feel like an outsider. They feel like an outcast. And, um, and, and when you feel like an outcast uh, for us, we recognize that you aren't able to perform at your best because you're not necessarily being your best, um, which kind of transitions us into like uh, point number two, um, being your best self through authenticity. Um, we oft, I oftentimes have a lot of people, you know, ask me, like, do you feel like you can be your authentic self? And the uh, reality and the truth of it is, is that a lot of times um, you can't 100 percent be your most authentic self. Um, it'd be no different than, you know, some of the stuff that you would do with your friends. You probably wouldn't necessarily always do with, your, you know, your parents or your grandparents, per se. And I like to kind of take that same approach when I think about like, what does it mean when it when it's saying show up and be your best self or be your most authentic self? Um, I like to really kind of think of it and position it as in my being my absolute best best. Like, am I being authentic to who I am as a person? But am I showing up the way in which I need to show up every day? Am I able to perform at the level that I need to perform because I feel comfortable? I feel included. I feel like the value uh, that I'm bringing to the team is appreciated. Um, I feel connected to the work. Uh, so uh, I think for us, it's really like our, our leaders creating an environment where you really truly could show up and be your absolute best. Um, oftentimes we talk about, uh, you know, like trust and, and, and building, um, you know, a sense of community, if you will, um, at your organization or with your team. And if you're able to do that again, does that, you know, create a space for you to be innovative and creative and, you know, kind of step up in a way um, that allows you to perform at heightened levels. Um, the last thing that we'll talk about here is uh, leadership engagement and investment. Um, you know, when it comes to a sense of belonging, you know, we always tell people here at Walmart that uh, leaders or people don't leave necessarily the job or the company, they leave leaders. Um, and so for us, ensuring that we have leaders that are inclusive um, and that are really deliberately thinking through you know, again, um, how do we, you know, break down the barriers to ensure that everyone has uh, equitable, you know, chances at being able to grow um, uh, their career and progress within the organization. 
Um, and this leadership piece is huge. Uh, and when it ties back to sense of belonging, you know, a lot of things that we talk about is your leader really truly invested in you as an individual. Are they pushing you from a growth and development perspective? Um, are they really truly sitting down and mapping out from a career progression perspective, like um, where they see you in the next three to four years? What is it that you need to do based off, you know, where you want to be in the next four or five years to be able to obtain that um, and to achieve that? Are they creating an environment, you know, that helps you be your absolute best self? And do you feel like that you can be who you truly are um, at the core, um, of course, with limitations of being able to perform? You know, with uh, that leadership um, and that team and, and things of that nature. So, essentially, again, this boils uh, back down to uh, why we feel like it's important is uh, we feel like that it is, you know, again, creating a sense of belonging, um, increasing the uh, engagement and um, uh, retention for our associates, and then overall uh, increasing the company reputation so that when people think of Walmart, um, and think of all of the things that we're doing that they know and trust that we are genuine in our approach that we are authentic about really wanting to move the needle and that we've put actions into play that will help us be able to attain, uh, obtain the goals that we have set out to achieve for ourselves. So uh, that is essentially um, what I have for you today to kind of help walk through again, what is Walmart doing and why it's important and, and connecting the dots back to uh, our business with our uh, culture diversity, equity and inclusion strategy. Okay. Candace, we did have one question come through if you wouldn't mind taking it. Sure. Who developed the leadership racial equity training was it developed in-house or contracted out? No, it was actually contracted out. We are leveraging a third party vendor to help us with that. Um, and we are now at the process of rolling out a number of different options. Uh, so again, last year, our focus was really getting the rest of our leadership team on board um, and kind of through this more in-depth training. We're now looking at creating kind of in-house based off what we've learned. Um, maybe some key nuggets. How do we take some of those things that we know are going to be really uh, uh, critical to be able to roll out to our field uh, associates that are, you know, um, uh, in our stores and clubs and our DCs across uh, uh, the US. So we're looking at a number of different things. We've also had some other third party vendors come in and really talk about, you know, just how race uh, uh, racial, uh, the racial divide and racial inequities are impacting, you know, the workplace and, and really kind of coupling that with unconscious bias to be able to break down some of the barriers there. Wonderful. Okay, we'll turn it back over to Dr. Cunningham. Thank oh, you so much. Okay, thank you, Leah. Uh, uh, we're grateful for your presentation. Uh, Candice, uh, I was I was especially uh, intrigued by Walmart's uh, their initiative to send people to Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, I never heard of any initiative like that for any company, and so I think that's a really unique way to get people first-hand experience uh, as to what the civil rights movement was all about. So I, I just want to applaud Walmart for, for that. Thank uh, you. I would. Totally agree with that, Dr. Cunningham. I actually had the pleasure of taking one of those trips and some of the museums that we were able to visit um, and some of the people that we were able to meet with, again, life changing. Um, and for those that may be hesitant to get on the journey, it's these types of things, whether it's the racial equity training or the cultural immersions that really kind of help people get over the hump um, who may not necessarily understand or connect to why diversity, equity, and inclusion are so important. It's been instrumental in helping our leaders connect the dots in a different way. Oh, great. Well said. Dr. Cunningham? Yes. Um, we did have two additional questions come in. Candace, I don't know how much time you've allotted. Um, we can always take these questions down, or um, if you feel comfortable answering them, I can I can talk to them to you now. Okay. Um, have you attended the blindfold lunch or any other events and saw it um, how it affect the, the new employees? I have. Uh, I actually <laughs> attend most of the everything that I presented to you. I have either been intricately a part of and helped from a planning perspective or I helped build out the strategy for. 
So uh, dining in the dark is extremely impactful. Um, one of my uh, dear friends and colleagues actually is blind, um, and he uh, is one of the ones that, that uh, facilitates this particular session. Um, and even though I work with him closely, um, I will tell you there was one time where we co-facilitated and there were certain things that he even walked uh, the team through that I didn't realize. And I'm like, but I work with you every single day. Um, and so uh, he kind of helps educate on like how you, you know, engage someone who has a disability without offending them, whether it, you know, he walked us through how to, you know, where to appropriately hold his arm so that way we could effectively lead and guide him so that way he still has some independence um, and still can be viewed and seen as a leader within the workplace but still you know get the support that he needs to be able to successfully navigate um, and you don't realize just how impacted you are you know uh, by your senses until you have one removed so um, I, I can't put into words the feeling of what it's like to have to actually eat lunch um, and in particular maybe a spaghetti lunch and not necessarily know exactly like where the food is going, you know, are you using your utensils correctly? Do you have anything on your face? And so having to rely on someone to really help you know, guide you through that, um, that experience is eye opening. And then, like I said, when you personally have to go through that, and I can say the same thing about, you know, my cultural immersion in Montgomery, um, it's one thing to say that you are aware and you know, but when you have to personally experience it or when you're in the moment and you don't have a choice but to focus on the the you know things that are around you it connects you in a different way um and like i said i think those things these immersion type of aspects um, have been really instrumental in helping our leaders really get to a different place wonderful any suggestions on how an organization can begin making employees feel like more of an insider during the onboarding process um, so we leverage our associate resource groups and a lot of other companies call them employee um, resource groups or even sometimes colleges and universities will call them kind of like affinity groups. We really leverage those groups to help connect the dots so that people find, you know, a, a common ground, if you will. Um, it's a great way, one, to network, but I also tell people it's a great way to really tap into, especially someone who's fairly new um, and, and very early in their career journey as a whole like of just understanding the unwritten rules that maybe your organization has. Um, and for those that don't know, unwritten rules are, what are the things that you wish someone would have told you? What are the things that you need to know that in order for you to be able to successfully navigate an organization or a company with, that no one has like formally written, if you will, like in a handbook or a guide that they're going to give you. Um, I'll give you an example of uh, one quick um, um, and very easy unwritten rule. So uh, we have, you know, corporate planes here at Walmart. And a lot of times, you know, if you get invited to fly with an officer, that's really considered a big deal. If you are the most junior person, you know, uh, on the actual trip, you probably don't need to be the last person to show up because when the leader shows up, you know, the most uh, tenured leader or the highest ranked leader shows up, the plane is ready to go because they've naturally built a schedule based off their availability and what they're doing. Like this is normally their trip. so. You don't want to be the last one to show up. And that's something that no one would really ever tell you. It's not written anywhere. Um, but the, that's one of those unwritten rules that would be a nice to know. So that way you can ensure that you're making the best first impression possible when you get an opportunity um, to be exposed to senior leadership in that way. Um, and so uh, not only is it, like I said, just great for kind of understanding to, you know, navigating um, the unwritten rules, networking, and then also too. Uh, very early in my career, I was actively engaged in our social resource groups and the skills that I needed in order to grow my career, I wasn't necessarily getting in my day job. Um, my day job didn't necessarily allow me an opportunity to lead cross-functional teams, to lead maybe some programs. Um, my day job was, my back, background is in supply chain, and my day job was really focused on that, whereas being actively involved in a resource group got me more connected to what are the you know, other business units and what are they doing across the company? How do I actually connect with other leaders when they don't necessarily, you know, I, I don't work with them when it comes to my day to day job. So uh, for me um, and what we try to really encourage people to do, especially if you're new, is to really connect with those associate resource groups to help you. Wonderful. Thank you. No problem. All right, Dr. Cunningham, throwing it back to you. OK, thank you. Uh, we're so grateful for your presentation, Ken. This has been very informative uh, and in some ways inspiring. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time to visit with us today. 
Uh, also to those who have been on the, on the call or the video, uh, we thank you for joining us also. And we have one more session. It'll be a panel discussion with some more thought leaders at four o'clock today. So we ask you to feel free for you to join us at that particular time. Thank you and have a good day.